know, they didn't fire me, they could have easily fired me. And the FBI keeps showing up saying, what is one of your employees doing? They should buy me. And there's a funny story on the uh, days that the IBM people and the big corporation were going to come for a tour of the studio. Ray would ask me to take down the civil rights photographs from the walls in the darkroom area where I had them. She, he said, just, she said, you know, just for the visit, you can put them back up tomorrow. That's great. Like, you didn't, they didn't, he was sympathetic. They were very, they, they, they had, when they were younger, they had very liberal leanings. But, you know, you learn to compromise when you're dealing with billion dollar corporations. Well, and they were business, they were business people. They were, yeah, well, they became, you know, they, their clients suddenly, you know, were, were conservative. And actually, they, 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 were, they were more exaggerated, they were more concerned than it was realistic, because a lot of the people that came from the big corporations were not conservatives. I mean, they were sophisticated, well-educated people, but you know, they're, they're, the idea of you know, the corporate mentality. And also the kind of, I'm sure, the pall of like communism and, and you know, what was going on was still kind of hanging over, yeah. so you mm -hmm. didn't really know who was who, and people put up a and front. Ray would make nice donations to all the liberal causes, but always anonymously. It was funny. That's great. So I guess um, one of the things that you were talking about before that um, I did want to get on camera was, will you just tell us just what kind of cameras that you, you like the history, you were explaining to these guys before about the cameras that you used? Mm -hmm, I can talk about that. Yeah. You can. You can't? <laughs> I can. Are we, are we rolling? Yeah. And we have been? Oh, that's nice. I thought we were just having a conversation. We are. Just think having we, were, a we were making history. We are just having a conversation. <laughs> you mean, yeah. The cameras at the at, at Eames or No, mine? just the cameras, like your history, what cameras you started out oh. using. <laughs> Is there one particular one that you used? Well, I can tell you the one that I started with, which was a disaster. And that, I, it's, it, it is in camera history. It was called the Perfex. Can you believe you know, that? That should have, should have been a warning, but as I recall, it cost me $15. And I think I took terrible photographs, I mean, technically, for about a year. It was a 35 millimeter, and I knew I was, I was taking good pictures, but I couldn't make any prints. And I was, you know, making prints in, in the bathroom and washing them. In the, a lot of your prints here in your collection were washed in bathtubs. And they were, apparently I did a good job because apparently none of them are showing any, any fading or you know, uh, any of the problems. And I can't imagine you know, how I was so lucky. And how, how you were so lucky that you have things that are not contaminating everything else. I do have boxes at home, prints that smell bad. Uh, I wouldn't give them to anybody. Um, but I wasn't taking pictures. I mean, they're probably, they're, they're probably somewhere, those perfect photos. But, uh, and when I bought, bought my first camera, which was a, a Leica, a, a black-bodied Leica from the 1930s, working perfectly, I took suddenly, technically, marvelous pictures, but they weren't of much interest. I, was, I bought it when I was in an hour, a, a year-long stay in Iowa, and I photographed icicles and uh, country roads and things like that, and some still lifes that were very fabricated. And I had, you know, the prints are there, and they're nice photographs, but they're not of, of any interest. But, I, but suddenly, technically, I knew that I could achieve things that satisfied me in that respect. But I didn't really start taking any serious photographs, um, as I sort of visualize it, remember, after um, Justine, my first wife, left me. And I was very lonely and isolated, except for I didn't know Wally and Shirley and the art people around them. So they, I didn't think of them as art people. I started, I bought a, um, a Rolleiflex and a four by five Linhoff. And I started doing early morning walks just after the sun was up. And I didn't want to be around people except the few personal friends I had. I photographed old Venice. And that's why we have those marvelous photographs of Ocean Park and the beach in for those early days. And they're technically marvelous shot them on generally four by five, and saw found things that you know weren't going to be around for very long, but I didn't know. Uh, and they suited my mood, which was loneliness and despair. But I don't, when I look at them now, they just look like marvelous antique views of a world that used to be. But my, my, they, they serve my purpose. Well, I think um, the feelings come through pretty clearly. 
Well, you know, they are of another, they, they, they sort of look like from the 1930s. They have a quality of, a, and, and they probably originated from that period because they went through the 40s, they didn't change during the war, and then in the 50s when I was photographing them, they were contemporary, but they were definitely on the, on the way out. Fortunately, we have, we have them now. And when did, when did you have a dark room, a proper dark room set up? I never, I never, I, mean, I always had an adequate dark room from, from Inadequate? Uh, no, adequate. You're, okay. I mean, inadequate, but adequate. Okay. I mean, primitive, but allow, allowing me to make my own prints. And uh, so, uh, I always needed, needed my own dark room. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just part of how I saw it. And when I started photographing my friends and then more spontaneous, I used both, I used the Roloflex and the, and the, and the, uh, and the Leica. So I have a 35 millimeter and a lot of two and a quarter negatives, and you have them, and they're uh, excellent. And they're, they were, and they fought. the only limitations were my imagination, and being with good people, and you know, and then getting coming getting out of my melancholy uh, allowed me to take a, a wider variety of, of material, and much more of the world was accessed for me through my new friends, and Wally and Shirley introduced me to a nice small circle of people, all of whom needed other people, but all had trouble finding the right ones, because there aren't that many who are fit, you know, the, the peculiar nature that you've developed over your young life. And that I see some, you know, I see these pictures, and it reminds me that there weren't, maybe there's a circle of 15 or 20 people, and then there are a lot of people peripheral to those people, but they drifted in and out. But there are a certain circle of people that uh, just hung out with each other and stayed overnight with each other, sometimes stayed for days in between. Sometimes they didn't have any place to, else to go, but they just not happier to be in your, your hangout but, than their own. And I was photographing mainly uh, 200 quarter and uh, 35 millimeter. But every so often I'd get, I'd get, I'd get out the four by five and just decide if it felt like the right time, if it was kind of slow and leisurely. And there's some really lovely photographs that were taken on four by five film of people. But, it was, but that was always spontaneous and it wasn't planned. I didn't really have a style that I was aware of. Well, you see that, I mean, this, you see a style developing, um, you know, especially in some of these informal, you know, portraits of friends and hanging around the scene. And, so maybe we could start um, by going through, because there's a few folders of people who we didn't really identify, and um, I thought we could start, and these were, um, was Artie and Betty Richard. So can you, can we go through some of these prints that we pulled, and can you kind of tell us what we're looking at? Well, this is interesting, because it relates to, to another area we talked, from our, our previous session, we talked about the Sindel Studio. Right. Uh, you know, the, fir the first gallery that Walter Hopp set up. And uh, Artie Richard had a, a marvelous exhibition there. And at that point, he, he had created a very nice body of oil paintings. And he was relatively stable. And uh, he and his family were relatively secure. And, and, I, and, you know, and, and, and here, you know, this is a series from the, now this wouldn't be, and this is this is from the Sindel. Oh, and here's a, a marvelous picture that was not was like was not was not fabricated. Uh, a wall of already looking through the window and his, the announcement of the show, which was like you know very original. I'm sure you've got copies of that, which you know should be blown up for people to see. It's a really picture of him wearing a wearing a mask, and uh, dating the the announcement of the show. Uh, he was, and his family, like, were probably Betty Richer and two children, were like, at that period, a, you know, a great bohemian example of what looked like a, a, a solid family situation. He was working, painting, there were children. Uh, behind it all, they were falling to pieces. I mean, they had no money. He was drinking too much. Uh, he was, this one, I mean, he looks like in total despair. That was on. That was at the Sindel, and he well, he probably was, but he had a cigarette. Yeah. He was probably you know wiped out for one reason or another. But but he'd raise his face and he'd be smiling, 
and uh, uh, this is Betty Richard. Artie would be out trying to raise money, trying to get by, by Kansas, and Betty and the children would be left at home. And, is she still uh, alive? No, both of them died too early from drug overdoses. And I now know uh, the children, whom I did not grasp were going through a terrible situation, because Artie was abusive, Betty was neglectful, and they, were say, and there's, and they say to me, uh, how is it you folks had children? because they know at this point in their life that they were parented very poorly. This is a marvelous combination. There's, there's Artie at the Sindel show, uh, you can tell by the, the uh, telephone pole wall, Walter Hopps, David Meltzer, and there's somebody whose name will come to me who had a gallery in San Pedro who was part of this circle. And it, almost, it, all, it almost comes to me. Um, but this was, a, this was a, an excellent exhibition, and Artie was working. The, their personal lives were terrible, and their children remember those days with great bitterness. Um, but no one knew exactly what was, what was going on. It's funny because, like, these photos, it looks like he's at the top of his game, which he was in many ways and at the high point of his career. And then the other one of him, you know, kneeling down, which is probably either the same day or around the same time, probably. also captures him really just being in a moment of despair. Well, a lot of people were, were going through period. So this is something quite fast. I don't have the pictures right here, but Artie, when he was with, with his friends, was jolly and playful and laughing. And, her, and his children have said to me, they never saw him smile. He was always punitive and angry and dis dissatisfied, and they're kind of bitter. They look at these photographs of Artie and Betty as their parents having relatively good time, and as children they were receiving them, you know, as ne both neglectful and abusive, hmm. and that's very, very, very sad. Well, I wonder if there's a medium ground there, you know, if it, they were really like that or if they just have some resentment. No, the most well, except for Wally and Shirley, most of the people who had children probably shouldn't have had children. I mean, they, you know, they didn't grasp what was involved, and they were, you know, most of us were pretty immature. immature. Okay, great. Well, we can. In fact, it might be interesting sometimes for you to talk to, to uh, their children. Yeah. I mean, because they have a different, you know, and, uh, and they are very moved looking at these photographs because they see themselves, and then they see Artie clowning and jolly, and there's a lot of considerable bitterness. And, and basically, if you're leaving a life where you're going to OD, leaving your children, you know, with no parents, it's a pretty careless attitude. And, you know, the life they were leading, they knew the risks of the type of drugs they were taking. Right. And, and, and what they were exposing themselves to, which is, you know, you might say inconsiderate from the children's point of view. Well, and you know it's not going to end up, it's not going to go into a good no. place no matter what. Except for Wally and Shirley, who had, a Wally who, Drew, drew the line at a certain point. There were risky things that w w were in their lives, but he, he knew, I think he knew pretty well where to draw the line. And so the, they were stable and secure. So our next folder is the Phil Oaks material. And I realized that it comes from more than one session, and you, were, you pointed out that the first ones are part of the Century City demonstration. Yes, I, knew, I knew him over two or three year period. Uh, How did you come to him? Well, he appeared at the Ash Grove, uh, um, Ed Pearl's folk music club. That was where an enormous amount of great blues singers and contemporaries of your Barbara Dane. And, 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 and actually, that's a, 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 a part of the culture scene of that period that ought to be dealt with. Actually, a documentary is being made right now right, about know. all of the great people that came to Los Angeles. But I met him. Just because I went to a club and took some photographs and, and, and introduced him. And he became a regular visitor when he came to town. And where was the Ash Grove? It was on Melrose. It's a, it's, it is a comedy club now. 
but it was torched and burned for, by political enemies a couple of times, but always reconsumed. The, Didn't uh, they move down to the pier at one point in Santa uh, Monica? He you know, 10, 15 years ago. Okay. Uh, he did get enough backing to reopen on the pier, but he didn't have the financial backing to go through that first year or two where you can't, where you don't pay your bill, you don't make it. Right. And it's a shame because he had been the, uh, the avenue for so many successful people to start and he just couldn't get enough of them to guarantee that year or so that they needed and so he just went bankrupt. Right. But so it was Ed it. Pearl who started it. It was a folk club, and it was in on Mel in Mel, on Melrose mm -hmm, in, the yes. six, around, in the sixties. Yes, and and that is a whole new pro. As I say, there is a Ashgrove project being made right now. That's quite astounding. It's Ed who's doing the film, right? Mm -hmm, yes. In fact, that you know that that should be on your want list to, to be get up to date on yeah. that aspect of it because I only came on to it when it was relatively established, uh, and it, uh, Phil Oaks. He'd come to town and he didn't know as many people. And he was stopped by our house. We lived right off the Sunset Strip on Doheny. And uh, when he came to town, he needed two things. He needed a throat doctor because his voice was always bad because he smoked a lot. And he needed pot. The two things. He stayed at a motel in, in West Hollywood somewhere. And I have some probably photographs of, of his. And when he'd, come to, he'd come to town. And I would take him around. Actually, I took him to the county museum to see the Keenholt show that had the famous car with the door open or closed. Maxi Dodge. Yeah, depending. Uh, I took him to Forest Lawn. It was part of, I took him downtown to uh, some uh, civil rights police brutality cases. And, they, and, he, and occasionally he would draw upon something like that. There'd be a reference in one of his contemporary songs referring to the things that he had seen in our, our traveling around. And the picture, the picture that just happened to be on top of this pile was he was in town in 1967 at the big demonstration at the Century Plaza Hotel against the Vietnam War when President Johnson, which became a historic event about which another documentary film is currently being made. So this period now apparently is ripe and people are looking for their little specialties to go into. And there are two photographs of him uh, at the at the park before the big march, uh, wearing a double-breasted suit, <laughs> but not not too formal. And then I and then actually. He, but he was a really he was a smart, politically astute, aware. He was politically guy. conscious, and yeah. but at one but at one point he fell into the idea about stop agitating so much, just declare declare the war is over and get back to a. Not being too so being so political. Uh, there's some photographs of him. Uh, I took him out. I took him to uh, well, I, was, I was working at the Eames office at the time, and he came. To, I took him through the Eames office to show him all the entertainment. And where was the office in, at that time? Nine oh one Washington Boulevard in Venice, and it's, and it's a bunch of pictures in his in his hotel room playing the guitar. So the, the, uh, the railroad tracks outside the Eames office. Here's something actually from the at the Ash Grove. That's all I could get there. And here's kind of a marvelous picture. This was his road hotel room. His guitar. Here's a political pamphlet on a police killing. And he apparently, apparently he read, had, had a pile of the New York Times right. on his bed. And I see the headline here is the Mets beating the Braves for the <laughs> World Series. Oh, that, that headline of the New York Times is a, see, is, Sunday, April. Is a baseball game. That's what okay, like. well that's kind of marvelous. That's kind of, that's kind of rich. Yeah, but there's, there's so much but there are these piles of New York Times. I, 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 I mean, and these are outside the Eames office in Venice. So the train station went all the way down to Venice at that point. There were oh well yes the railroad tracks went to the beach at one point you know Los Angeles was going to be the main harbor. And people planned, this is back in 1910 or so, that Los Angeles would be the harbor. And so they had major railroad lines running all the way from downtown Los Angeles to the beach. And of course, that, for a variety of reasons, it failed. Well, these are very nice. So this is, all, this is all one session, pretty much, in his hotel room and then down. Well, no, it would be two sessions. It just means I didn't, I just kept the camera loaded 
So this is in Hollywood, and this is in Venice. And did you go see a lot of music during those days? And where did you go, and what type of music did you see? I didn't, no. I mean, it was part of whatever came to town that people would tell me about. But at this point, I was doing, I was doing political work. And I would, I would go to clubs. Actually, I must have gone, gone to a lot because at that same period, I photographed the Velvet Underground when they came to town. Right, which is what we so have I, there next. So I must have been going places. I think I, I think I was all all I did was political, but clearly. Uh, well, the thing is, if you you know, if we have Phil Oaks on one hand, and then we have Velvet, Velvet Underground on was, the other hand, I was covering. That's certainly a quite range of musical styles. I think probably what I think what what I, what I was reflecting when I said not so much music was my feeling of what was important to me. The music was interesting, but the politics were important. Right, your head was in a different, yes, and your it, focus was in a different... But I was doing it all because I, well, I had a lot of energy, and, uh, but I found, I, I think probably you know, the, uh, the Velvet Underground, that was, that, because that was avant-garde. That was, that, I guess that was the point. That was interesting. I wasn't just following. Apparently, I did photograph a lot of music, music groups who weren't important to me. And I didn't know who the people were. And in later days, people who did know will look at the photograph and say, oh, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. I said, I didn't know that. Well, like who else? Hmm? Who, like, who else was? Actually, yeah, you should ask Christine. Okay. Christine identified all these people. This, this, he was, this man's, this, this guy's from the doors. This is- Oh, some, right, because there's some, bur some of the birds with the whiskey. Yes, and I didn't, yeah. I, and in my mind, they, were, they didn't register me as important. Okay. But so, but you do, there is a whole series of photographs of the Velvet Underground um, when they were um, and, doing... But, but, you know, their interest to me wasn't that they were music, but that they were part of the Andy Warhol art avant-garde scene. Well, and this is a whole performance, and they had films, and can you tell us a little, A, where was this, what, what it was a it was, it was a club on Sunset Strip. They, don't, they didn't exist very long. They played three nights and they were closed by the police because they did this really phony sadomasochistic playing with whips and stuff and it was looking back at it it was like so, so sophomoric but apparently it was too challenging for the Los Angeles police who uh, someone someone must have complained I don't I can't imagine why because this was a period where Warhol came out to Hollywood trying to make a scene in Hollywood and, and several books have been written. Mary Warren uh, wrote a book describing, you know, their abortive attempt to establish roots in Hollywood. They didn't make it. So right. they, had, they had the big show at the Ferris Gallery with the floating balloons and things. But in terms of like making it with movie people, uh, they, 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 there was a disconnect. Yes. They, 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 well, I think Mary Warren's story was that there was another band that was playing that was down the street that were that they were kind of in competition with and they complained that to the fire marshal that there was too many people in the um, okay, in their that, venue and then the cops came and that kind oh, of was the, that triggered them. But what, can you like tell us just a little bit about what was it like going to see them and what the whole setup was and well, what made it, was, it different? It was, that, it was a original in the, that they, Warhol had, you know, loved audiovisual stuff. So they were projected uh, movie images there was smoke, there was a lot of strobe lights. He created a, a theatrical event. Uh, and, and most of the music groups at that time didn't do that. They just played their music. Uh, they, had, you know, they, they had a lighting engineer and they'd have some effects, but basically they just played. But the Velvet Underground and all the uh, Warhol stuff were the theater, theater pieces. And so there was you know, a variety of, of fascination that Los Angeles people hadn't seen. I think San Francisco people had, you know, who had light shows at the uh, film oh, or places right. like that, had seen a lot of that. We, Los Angeles did not have much of that. It was like we were poor relatives as well, far as audiovisual culture, which is surprising. I guess Hollywood is not really, I mean, they make movies, but they aren't audiovisual. Well, it was a different and, level of fantasy. Psychedelia yeah. was more coming out of San Francisco. So people in Los Angeles did pick up on that and make some movies about the, the beat generation and about psych the psychedelic world, but none of it originated here. It, it was always like an, an import 
then. We were like poor relatives. We got the cast-offs, basically. And what did you think of the Velvet Underground when you first saw them? Well, I thought they were fun. I mean, they were fun, but they were, they were like putting on the establishment. I mean, they were doing, I mean, you know, they, they weren't, um, they weren't psychopathic or sexualists. They weren't craft ebbing. They weren't anything that gave you a chill. I mean, they were like children's, children's sadomasochism. Uh, and, and, and he was, like, Andrew Warhol puts people on and he knows the level of the shock value that you don't have to go very far to shock Americans. You don't, and, uh, and he didn't go very far, but where he went seemed an enormous leap of you know, amazing degeneracy, which was like kind of, kind of laughable. Well, there was no edge there. But, no. But that, but, yeah. But these photographs, I mean, they seem rather euphoric. Well. We're capturing that. That's you. Yeah, well, it's the photos. <laughs> Come on. I mean, they're, they're not very clear what's going on. They're a little bit chaotic. They're a good record, but it's, and then, except for, you know, uh, what's her name? Nico. Except for Nico, but who's sort of statuesque and as an ideal. But, you know, she's, it's like, it's also surface. But there was a lot going on. I mean, it's chaotic. There it's was a chaotic lot of, scene. There was a lot going on with, with the people in the audience who were m much hipper and cooler uh, than, than, than the Velvet Underground actually, was, actually were. This is a good shot. Yes, that's Did the, you ever, did, were these? That's Lou Reed in the background. Yeah. Um, and Gerard Moenga. Yeah. Um, and Mary Warnock. Like, did, look, look at, look at him. He's pudgy. He can, he can have a whip, but you have to laugh a little. Like he's a little boy pretending to be rough trade, and he's not. Well, everybody can't be rough, rough trade. No. Girls. Um, but he was rough. They were, they, were, they were rough enough for Los Angeles to get right. clothes. Did you ever print these? Were these photos used anywhere? No, I didn't even know I had them. I mean, I photographed them. I made prints, a few prints at the time. They were only later rediscovered at the time that this period now is historically important to people. Who printed them? Was it Christine who saw them and said, oh, uh, we should? Christine identified and she said, there are people who want these pictures. And we just sent them out to a good local lab. I probably made a few prints at the time and gave to friends, but they weren't important to me because I had a lot of other things happening. Okay. So now our next load, our Jones party. Oh. And, and these are a lot of the same characters that you've identified, but maybe we could just kind of go through a few of the top ones and you can just tell us. Who, where was the party? <clears throat> Two of my friends, uh, and friends of a lot of people were Bob Jones and Dominique, who was a dress designer had a marvelous small uh, circulation of knit wear that was being sold, sold at the boutique shops. And he was an artist and a psychologist or studying to be a psychologist. And they were just good, interesting people. And they, after they got married, they gave parties and they weren't extraordinary parties, but nice people came. And every so often I would show up and take photographs. And so we have, we have proof that interesting people. And the photographs are just, you know, fly, just flash photographs taken in the dark. Oh, really? And I didn't know, actually hardly knew what I was going to get because, you know, the light level was so low. So we have Wally Berman dancing, which no one ever saw. And he's clean shaven and he's wearing shiny, well cared boots. Like, you know, it's, it's really extraordinary. And a button-down striped, pinstripe shirt. Uh, and there are pictures of like interesting people, in, and they were basically see. It was really dark, and they were totally unconscious. And since I was a close friend, they didn't mind that the flash kept going off. Yeah. Who's this woman? Um, Beverly Walsh, who shows up over and over again. In your pictures. And and uh, there, uh, and here's a uh, a Rand Corporation economist. And his wife, and Beverly is t 
taunting and teasing him. That's right. And the, and this oh this is like this is uh, Zach Walsh and Beverly uh, coming down. I mean they probably been smoking pot and all of a sudden the joy went out of it and they went out in the backyard and you can see she's desperate like you know this is down everything and she's gorgeous and it was in the dark uh, it's like you know it's like this is he, he doesn't seem to know what's going on no nobody seems pretty aware nobody and, uh, seems aware and there's a Dean? Dean Stockwell. Yeah. Is he awake? I don't know. He looks like he's just kind of in a state <laughs> of And here's somebody thread in a necktie, with already a necktie and French cuffs. His shoes are on at least. And we were drinking ch cheap wine and Beverly's dancing. Yes. And more of the same. Oh, and, it, and it maybe we'll come to pictures of Hubert Cornfield. And There's, that's a good one of Dean. That's yeah, it's Martha Shirley. And her, her shoes, shoes were being shed. And, that, and there, there's Wally, you know, happily out of it, uh, but on, and on his feet. And I, somebody knows who the, who, the, who the girl is. I don't remember. It's like a wild party, but it was not wild. I mean, it, people were smoking pot and drinking beer and wine. Uh, there was no, there were no hard drugs. There was no nudity, there was no uh, sex in the corner. Uh, there's Hubert Cornfield, the director, who showed up in a suit and tie. And, he, and his specialty that night was dumping girls off his lap. <laughs> and apparently they, they kind of lined up to, really? uh, to be... Really? get dumped? Yes, uh-huh. Well, it just looks like a nice casual affair, a fun party. There should be a, a big... Let's see if we can find the big color print I, I made of. There's color prints, I think, in the next. Um, there are small color prints, though, let's see. There, was, there the is somewhere one. one big color print. That's going to be the centerpiece in the uh, Graybull Press book. Oh. Of, of, uh, is it a group shot? It's a shot of Hubert dumping somebody and somebody else spread out in exotic abandon. Let me see, here's the next. Um, here with the color ones. Would be any of these. So you shot in color. That's, this is from yeah, the same I'm, party. Oh, there's the picture. There's the picture. Okay, because these are from the same party, so you shot in color. And black and white. Okay. I can't quite imagine how I was doing that, but I was doing it. That's the shot? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's great. And then I just wanted to bring out the Anita O'Day photographs because she passed away last week. She died, she died on Thanksgiving almost. Oh, was it on Thanksgiving Day? In fact, I went to a screening about three months ago of the documentary on her. Oh, really? Yeah, that's a documentary. God, that everybody's actually, making documentaries. That, that actually was completed. And, uh, and she was there and I got, you know. Oh, we, really? We were, we were neighbors at that one period of her life. Uh, we, she lived right upstairs from me. What period was that? When you were on Speedway, right? On, on Speedway, and she lived upstairs, and I lived downstairs, and uh, that's how I, why I have all this stuff because I got to know her a little bit, and I got to know John Poole, her drummer and companion. They were together for many, many years. And so she showed up at the she was she in, she was in the film, and she was an interviewee, and she showed up at the screening. She well, you know, she up and she just made a, another uh, album last year, and she. And I think she died at 87, so she uh, was able to perform again and just stayed with it. Uh, and I, it was she, kind of, I'm sure she didn't remember me, but, I, but it was marvelous to see her. Was she in good shape when you saw no, her? Or she was no, no. She, well, she was 87 years old, and she was very frail. And, uh, and she, you know, she was vulnerable to pneumonia and things like that. And she was, when she died, she was recovering from pneumonia, but she just died of heart failure age and beaten up but I got all this all these old photographs these are ones that you shot though right no, no. this is not you didn't shoot this okay no these are like her publicity photographs any of these did you shoot I don't well I don't think so this, this is probably and that's John Poole the young so you didn't shoot any of these uh, if they're uh, probably they're in a pile together because these are survivor and that and a number of them are photographs 
John must have saved them. These had been torn up, torn into four, and had been then retaped. Yeah. So apparently there was some emotional thing where these four, either he tore Maybe. them up or she tore them up. Maybe they got into a fight and, or something. And then somebody put them back together, which yeah. is like probably part of part of the story. So oh, none oh, of oh, here's Lenny Bruce all of a sudden. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a bit the inappropriate. That, that was probably a club on the on the strip. And did you shoot this? Yes. Really. Yes, because your name is on yeah. that. All yeah. right. First, okay, before now, we go uh, to Lenny, let's go through now. now some the, of these you the, did the, shoot. These are, this, the, right. Yeah, these were all publicity photographs. And these are ones you yeah. shot mm -hmm. outside the house. Yes. Uh -huh. She looks in, so in the backyard. She looks so butch. Well, she was when she first started. Uh, playing uh, for the big bands, she refused to wear the band costume thing. That, Which were those like, you know. She wanted to wear a jacket and pants. She wore a, a blazer she, and, a, and a tie often. Uh, she was tough, but she had a lot of boyfriends. She had a number of abortions. She, uh, but she was tough, uh, and, uh, but, but she was fine. She wrote that book. She didn't, didn't she write that autobiography? Well, well somebody wrote it with, yeah, well, with their whatever. advice. But, um, and she was into drugs pretty heavily, right? She was yeah, very well documented. She was busted about a couple of times and went to jail. But these are all in the backyard of the, of the house on, uh, on Speedway in Venice. And uh, yeah, these, these are very representative of her style and of her, oh, here's so the, you go here's the downstairs, <laughs> downstairs uh, neighbor drug dealer that I have some, some sad anecdotes about. Now, did you go? Did you go see her perform a few? A times? couple of times, yes. Actually, she or probably John, because John came to hang out with me a lot. Oh, it's really this is a, like all of a sudden here's the here's here's the Lenny Proust uh, shots I took. There was a there there this was part, there, this was I reckon I, this became part of the drug culture world. Uh, this guy lived downstairs in an apartment that I, I had previously lived in when I had moved upstairs after Anita O'Day moved on. And one morning, one Sunday morning, uh, he came up and said, you know, want to come down and have coffee? We have a visitor. This guy, this guy. Yes. And the visitor was Lenny Bruce, who had actually come from a performance or something. He'd wear the, the suit outfit that he normally wears when he performed. He'd come out to score. He'd come out to buy some drugs. So I came down and, and he was picking his nose and I took the photographs of him. Um, what kind of drugs was he dealing? Hard drugs. No, Heroin? Probably. I don't know. I didn't get into the details. And this is a very interesting <laughs> photograph of a girlfriend of theirs who was, going to, was, was about to go to jail. So they invited her out be just the, like the weekend before she's going to go to jail to, uh, for her to celebrate. To, to supply her anything she wanted because she wasn't going to be having any fun for a while. Oh my God. Sex and drugs and music and fun. And it wasn't glamorous. I mean, she's just a, a happy girl yeah. getting ready to go to jail. Well, so and, it, you, and you can sort of see them hanging out, being kind of jolly. Um, and some very sad stories about this man's wife after he was arrested. Uh, the police would come by and... and invite her out to their police car and demand oral sex from her. And she said, I had to do it because you know, basically they could take my child away from me. Right. They could make it harder. What kind of, really was stupid. Lenny okay with letting you photograph? Did you, you yeah. knew well, no, who he, he was? He, I knew who he was and he just knew I was a friend of a friend. I was a friend of his connection. Right. And you, know, you, 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 you accept yeah. you know, who comes with the, with the scene. And he was okay with you photographing? Yes. Uh -huh. And had you ever seen his work yeah, mm -hmm, before? Yeah, I've seen him a, a couple of times at club performances on the Sunset Strip. Who to separate these? At least I know which ones are which. And some of them are just basically the scene at the beach. Uh, but this was not related. None of this was related to any of the art people. Right. But look, here's this. What you obviously this is Lenny Bruce that, that was in probably, a performance. That was at whatever club I saw in that, the Macambo or something like that. Um, Doing, doing his show. Actually, this had, this had to be in the early 60s. He was doing his snot routine. And de, you know, demystifying the word snot. He did, did a pretty good job. Well, that was kind of one of his specialties, of demystifying the yeah. word shape. He, he was in good shape. And he, and he hadn't been uh, arrested too many times. 
so he had to become focused on you know being persecuted, which he had a, you know a good case for making, but it kind of uh, affected the nature of his routines. At this point, he was just being funny. Well, look, I mean, all of these people that um, are in this one particular box are all people who, you know, through various instances were persecuted in their own ways mm -hmm. and were dealing with drugs and just kind of came to... And the other thing is, they all relate to where I lived. They had a... These are all geographically clumped in one... Two little buildings in well, one little spot. Speed, you see the oil... The oil things in the background of a lot of these. Now this is in the back, the backyard of the house or the two buildings that we all lived in. So there are like, you know, several unifying themes to, the, to this collection of pictures. And clearly, they, can only be, they only can be explained by someone who knows, like, yes, like me saying, this is what this is, which is, it makes it very clear that this folder needed some conversation. And what years did you live on the Speedway? Not like through the years. Okay, don't worry. About it had to be uh, the late fifties. No, I, I had to. I could only identify things by wives, wives, <laughs> and other disasters. You put the wives and the other disasters in the same category. I had to. Well, up until a certain point, then when Barbara and I first met. I had two failed marriages, and she had had one. She was getting out of it. We were very sophisticated, we thought. And we were saying, you know, 